Um, my name is Lynn Bolger, and I am the executive director of the Authors Guild Foundation. WIT is our Words, Ideas, and Thinkers series, where we explore interesting and important issues and ideas of the day. Part of the Authors Guild Foundation mission is to promote an understanding of the value of writers and books. And this is one way we do just that. So um, the Justice Department recently stated it this way, quote, without authors, there would be no stories, no poetry, no biographies, no written discourse on history, arts, culture, society, or politics. Yes, that was the US Justice Department people. So you know that that's that and what's what. Today, we are in for such a treat. We have both a Shakespeare and a Lincoln scholar with us, and each had a critically acclaimed book out last year. Jim Shapiro, who serves on the Authors Guild Council, is professor of English and Comparative Literature at Columbia. He specializes in Shakespeare and the early modern period. I met him this fall um, and I have to say, I was a little nervous um, as I was walking to our lunch date, I was expecting to find a very serious highbrow scholar who would correct my grammar and intimidate me intellectually on purpose. But instead over our rice bowls with tofu, I found a very funny, irreverent, charming and easygoing guy <laughs> who did intimidate me intellectually, but not on purpose. He is the author of most recently, Shakespeare in a Divided America. The book itself, as we'll hear tonight, is divided into chapters with hot button issues throughout US history, including same-sex marriage, class warfare, and miscegenation, to name a few. Jim shows us in the book how US presidents, activists, and other writers, conservatives, and liberals alike have turned to the Bard's plays to explore these issues, mining quotes, stories, lessons, to use to their own ends, political and otherwise. And we will get to the Lincoln chapter, especially tonight, which is called Assassination, about both Lincoln and Booth's obsessions with the plays. Now let's turn to Ted, my old friend Ted. Despite being in a punk rock band earlier in life, Ted Widmer is better known as an American historian, writer, librarian, and speechwriter in the Clinton White House. He is the author of at least nine books, one of which is a comic book called Boston Powers. Both are serious, but most are serious works of history, including a biography of Martin Van Buren, a collection of American speeches, and with Carolyn Kennedy, a book entitled Listening In, The Secret White House Tapes of John F. Kennedy. I have known Ted for many years, and he is always in the middle of some remarkable project. For instance, with his class at the Macaulay Honors College at CUNY, where he teaches, he created an exhibit for the Morgan Library called Walt, Walt Whitman, The Bard of Democracy. He also edited for the New York Times Project 1919, the year of the crack up, which was this fascinating series of long features on the legacy of 1919 and the way that that singular year shaped the modern world. Ted's book, Lincoln on the Verge, 13 Days to Washington, was published last year, and we'll be talking about that soon. So um, that's it for me. I'll turn it over to you two. Thank you, Lynn. I, I want to take issue with your introduction, as generous as it was. It was more a glam rock band than a punk rock band. So how should we do this, Jim? Um, um, well, first I wanna thank you for participating. We are not in the same room, obviously. You're up in Rhode Island, I'm in Manhattan, Lynn's up in Maine. Uh, let's just launch into it and talk about each other's books and how our Lincoln um, 
is the same man, is not the same man, or how reading each other's books might uh, have shaped our own understandings, because you're a real historian, I'm a fake historian, <laughs> literary scholars called cultural historians, which is a way of saying I'm not trained as an historian, but that gives me license to act like one, even though I haven't done the homework necessarily that a genuine historian uh, might do, and you have done on, on Lincoln and the Verge. And uh, just begin there, I think, and, and talk about each of our Lincolns, I suppose. Love it. And you know, I want to thank Lynn for her intuitive genius. I, I didn't know you until this event was organized, but your, your, your Shakespeare in a Divided America, you sent it to me as a PDF and I started reading it with ever growing fascination. And then I was, I read the Lincoln chapter and then I just kept going. And then I, I was like, I have to own this book. So I ordered it. So I have it and um, I'm already I just, I mean, in, in addition to tonight's talk, I can't wait to meet you, but you're doing stuff historians wish they could do. Um, historians wanna write nimbly and excitingly and, and they mostly fail, they try and fail. You're on it and you have such intuition about Lincoln. And I think you're looking at Lincoln through Shakespeare is so inspired because Lincoln interpreted a lot of his own reality through through Shakespeare. So already, I want to thank you and Lynn just for, for letting me read this book. You know, it, it's funny. I'm curious how you have learned about Lincoln because I'm a, a typical, you know, Brooklyn high school, public high school educated kid who uh, learned basically five facts about Lincoln uh, that he came from somewhere over there in this country on the other side of the Hudson and that a, a crazed uh, actor killed him. Not much more than that. And uh, being uh, uh, of a literary bent in, in college, I, I never took a course in American history. So knowing that there are hundreds, if not thousands of reputable books about Lincoln, it, it was really hard for me to find my way into the story simply because there's, you know, it's, it's kind of like going to Central Park and seeing 40 horse-drawn carriages each welcoming you and offering you a ride and not knowing which Lincoln carriage to, to, uh, to join. So I'm, I'm just curious as a Lincoln scholar, um, how did you train? How did you learn this stuff? Well, it, it's a strange story, but I'll, I'll tell it and I'll try to tell it quickly. I, I was fascinated by Lincoln as a, as a child. Um, I went on a train trip with my dad to Washington in about 1973. So I think that's somehow in this decision to write a book about Lincoln on the train. I was going back to a profound childhood moment and I remembered uh, I remember you, you could take an, a sleeper back then from Boston and Providence where I got on and come into DC at about 6.30 in the morning with the sun rising and you see it on the Capitol. And that happened to me and it was a mind blowing experience. And back then you could just walk from Union Station right into the Capitol and look at all the statues. And it was our democracy. This was, and my dad put up with me all day. I was, let's climb every step of the Washington Monument, and then let's walk to the Lincoln, and then the Jeff. You know, and it was, it was a beautiful day. And so, some of this book was remembering that, um, but also I had a kind of, you know, slightly strange feeling about Lincoln based on looking at photographs of him. And I'm, I'm still trying to figure this out. But even as a kid, I like to look. I had photographs of him stuck with thumbtacks uh, around my bedroom. And I would love to tell you exactly what that meant. I, I can't exactly, but I still think there's something extraordinary in Lincoln's face, this face that has so much sadness in it. Although like Shakespeare, as, as you know so well, there, there is comedy and tragedy in, in him and, and in his face. There aren't very many photographs of him 
well, there, there are almost none of him smiling. There's one which he's, his eyes are twinkling and his mouth looks like it might be about to smile, but it's not quite smiling. But um, this tragic figure drew me in because so much of our politics is about the false projection of joy and exuberance and optimism. And here was this different kind of figure. His life was tragic. I mean, even before his life ended, it was tragic. And so I just was pulled into the story. When I got to grad, uh, college and grad school, it was impossible to study Lincoln. Uh, the political currents of Harvard, where I went, were such that, um, I mean, with the best of intentions, it was important to study history from the ground up and, and the margins. And so Lincoln is not in the margin at all. He's the most famous American who has ever lived. So I couldn't really go near him, even though I wanted to. And then through the vicissitudes of life, I, I became a Clinton speech writer. And suddenly I was sort of reading Lincoln again for mm -hmm speech ideas and just literally walking around DC and going to the Lincoln Memorial and, and feeling the old magic. So I had it in my mind to write a Lincoln book some, someday. I never knew what it would be. And it's, it's really intimidating to go there. But I started a project for the New York Times in 2010 about the 150th of the Civil War. In the research for that, I kind of discovered this train trip and I thought that's a hell of a story. And finally, it'll be my Lincoln book. And I, I don't think I'll do another one. I, I began it loving Lincoln and I ended it loving Lincoln. And those are, that's a weird word to use as academics. We're not supposed to really go near love, but I, I did. And um, I'm happy with the book, but I think I'll probably move into other periods now. You know, it's funny that you talk about beginning with Loving Lincoln and ending with Loving Lincoln, and I imagine a, a deeper appreciation of him almost on a day-by-day -day basis since you, you take us through those extraordinary two weeks. For me, I, I began this book knowing that, and I read here and there that Lincoln had read Shakespeare or had quoted Shakespeare, but I, I didn't know more than that. And if most Anglo-American Shakespeare scholars know that writing about U.S. presidents and Shakespeare is a dead end. You know, nobody cares really what U.S. presidents have thought about Lincoln. So I began the book somewhat skeptical that I, or the chapter I should say on Lincoln, somewhat skeptical that I would find even enough information. And all of a sudden I discovered the information about Lincoln and his Shakespeare from his earliest years to his final days was immense. Yes. And as you know, there are really day-to-day -day accounts of Lincoln's life. And as I soon discovered, day-to-day -day accounts of John Wilkes Booth. Yes. By, by the, the Boothies, as they right. call themselves. Right. So I was able to kind of follow in their footsteps and discover just how deeply each man was. Yes. The, what I ended up realizing was as, as popular uh, and modestly talented an actor as John Wilkes Booth was, he was a terrible reader of Shakespeare and interpreter of Shakespeare. And the more I learned about Lincoln, who did not have a father as Booth did, who was one of the greatest Shakespeare actors of his age, didn't grow up in a household where there were manuscripts and plays all over and critical books as well. Lincoln had to fight for every scrap of Shakespeare that he came across as a young man. But I ended the book saying something that I've never said about anybody, which is Lincoln was the greatest reader of Shakespeare in America and possibly anywhere. And what I mean by that is not simply that Anytime he could grab anyone and recite lines from the half dozen plays that he truly loved, he did that. And we might call anybody else but Abraham Lincoln who did that a, a raging bore. But everyone who heard him recite Shakespeare was deeply moved by the experience, wrote about how moving that experience was. And I, I, I'm convinced that he felt Shakespeare 
far more deeply than I have, but more deeply than anyone I've ever come across or read about. And that was the, the real takeaway uh, from, from that research. Well, I agree. Your, your chapter blew me away. And I had read books about Lincoln as a writer. There, there are a few of them, and they all say Shakespeare right away. But you really went into it and, and into the simultaneous booth fascination, which is just so interesting. And Lincoln, I mean, Lincoln doesn't need us to put him on a pedestal. He's already on a pedestal. But this is a new thing that is incredible to know about Lincoln, that he, as you said, he may be one of our greatest interpreters of Shakespeare, literary, political, whatever, in, in American history. And if you told me James Garfield was the greatest reader of Milton, and I, I would be very impressed. That would be actually a lot to think about. And with Lincoln, there's so much already going on that it's sort of hard to add more in. But this is a remarkable thing about Abraham Lincoln, that with a very small education, uh, you know, just picking it up here and there, I think he went to something like three years of schooling total and no high school and no college. He became such a sophisticated reader. Um, certain phrases appear in the speeches, but also just the kind of feeling uh, of rhythm, of, of verse and, and of cadences of writing and, and understanding of the tragedy of the human condition is all in there and it's, it's incredible. For me, one of the shocking things was for somebody who wasn't formally educated in Shakespeare, didn't have the opportunities many uh, Americans had uh, by his day, he had a counterintuitive relationship. He didn't think, for example, to be or not to be was the greatest speech in Hamlet. It was Claudius's guilty right. speech. Right. And he keeps gravitating to these tortured souls in Shakespeare. And I found that extraordinary. And every time he could have personally or politically read a kind of triumphalist Shakespeare, he just rejected that. And I don't think anybody has recited Macbeth's tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow creeps in this petty pace from day to day. More, um, how should I put it, um, more feelingly than, than Lincoln did. And that, that was a problem for me as a writer. I mean, just the writing of this chapter. I, I don't like there are a lot of writers who are listening to us and will throw questions at us soon enough, but I don't like to write chapters that are longer than 6,000 words. And I, I, I love the size of your chapters in, in Lincoln on the Verge. You know, you take us a train ride from here to there. Yeah. By the time I'm done with that ride, I'm ready to put the book down for the night and pick it up in Cincinnati the next day. Right. Get a good night's sleep, just like I hope Lincoln did. <laughs> but this chapter kept ballooning. And all of a sudden, it wanted to be a book. And I knew it couldn't be a book. It only could be a chapter. And it had to be a chapter that went back and forth between Booth and his assassin until that final day at Ford's Theater and shortly after. But um, I've never had a chapter that gave me as much trouble as this one did because it's a bigger story than I was able to tell. And it was only one chapter among eight or so in the book. But I felt wretched every time I cut out a great Lincoln anecdote, because there are just so many of them. Many are similar, and that made it easier to cut. There are only so many times you can say he quoted Richard II or he quoted yeah. Macbeth, because yeah. he had his go-to plays, or yeah. how many actors he brought to the White House and argued with, uh, which he loved to do, which is also a class act on his part. Yes. Well, you pulled it off. I, I felt no signs of struggle as I read it. I just was um, exhilarated. And I felt you'd said things better than th things I'd been kind of thinking about, but you said them better. And you, you really nailed the weirdness of Booth also being a Shakespearean. I mean, it's just uh, this Shakespearean tragedy of an assassination. There were so many in Shakespeare. 
and it pulls together two Shakespeareans in 1865. And what a, what a strange thing in our history that that happened the way it did. And Booth is sort of acting while he's doing it. He like jumps onto a stage and tries to act. And then he's sort of disappointed by his bad reviews in the newspaper. You know, it's just all so crazy. Yeah, he wanted good reviews for the assassination. That's what he wanted. And he writes in his diary how crushed he was. I acted like Brutus. One of the things that I didn't know about Lincoln, and I'm happy to admit my ignorance, was that many thought he was a tyrant and suppressing habeas corpus, shutting down newspapers, and the list goes on and on. And those are not things that I, or charges that I knew had been leveled against Lincoln. So if you hated him, you could make a pretty good case that he was indeed a tyrant. And if you followed Julius Caesar, you can make a pretty good case, especially when your father was named after Junius Brutus, uh, the, the man oh, who right, killed, you know, who, who helped found Rome and banished the Tarquins. Um, you could make a pretty good case that Lincoln was a tyrant. And if you described yourself as Brutus or a conspirator, you could legitimate this political assassination. So I wanted to give Booth his, his due without writing him off in other ways as a white supremacist, which he was, and a racist, which he was, but his, his political take on Lincoln came right out of Shakespeare. Well, you pulled it off. I thought it was an extremely sensitive portrayal that doesn't obviously endorse Booth, but it shows a confused young man, just as you said, growing up in a, a remarkable or milieu of Shakespeare worship, basically, and seeking his own identity in a competitive family environment with a lot of other siblings, including his older brother, who's an even more distinguished Shakespearean actor than he is, and trying to find his way. And that way, unfortunately, became Brutus, and assassination. I have to ask you a question since you spent time in the Clinton White House. Bill Clinton was gracious enough to write uh, a forward to a Library of America volume that I put out on Shakespeare in America. And one of the things that I learned was Bill Clinton was a various, very serious reader of Shakespeare and Macbeth in particular. And Shakespeare characters who were ambitious right. in particular. And I'm curious if you ever heard him speak about Shakespeare in, in, any, in any way, in any form during your years of knowing him. Well, it's funny you should mention that. I wondered how to present this, but it's a Shakespearean twist in the middle of our conversation. And I was in the office of the Library of America one day working on one of my own projects. And the publisher, who I'm sure you know, Max Rudin, said he had a kind of, I have to be careful how I describe this, but a sort of garbled manuscript from Bill Clinton to, to introduce your book. He wasn't quite sure what to do with it. So I hadn't been his speechwriter for about 10 years, but I went back into speechwriter mode and quickly kind of massaged it and made it better. So it was so almost like a Cyrano thing where I took it, Bill Clinton's words, but made them a little better. And I'm not sure he's even aware that any of this happened. He probably isn't. And Max was delighted. Ted, Ted please do remember this is being recorded. It's okay. <laughs> I'm so old, what can anyone do to me, you know? But um, I think I think it's a Shakespearean plot twist that I, I got involved with the introduction to Jim's brilliant uh, Library of America volume, which I also have here, Shakespeare in America. Um, well, anybody who reads that Clintonian preface forward will feel as I did when I read it. This is pure Bill Clinton. So it speaks to your immersion in his words, in his orbit. Uh, I was asked to, by our mutual friend, uh, 
to, at, at the Library of America to just pass along some notes. And it came back in the voice of Bill Clinton. So I think you, you have that gift. And obviously very few people in, uh, at that political level write everything that crosses their desk or write every speech. But, but somebody has to actually speak in their voice and make you feel the person behind it. And I, I felt you did a remarkable job. I mean, I'm more impressed with it now that you did that than he would have done it simply because it, it shows your ear for Clinton's rhythms. Well, I, and thank you. I, I wanna be clear that the best parts are all him. I did a little tidying up as an editor and a former speechwriter. And, you know, there's such an aura around a president that nobody wanted to touch this. And so I could just go in and do it relatively fearlessly. But the best parts are all him, uh, absolutely. And I, I loved the story about being a high school student in Hot Springs. That's all him. And the quote, and the, the, about the, the, the sound and the fury signifying nothing, which also suggests Faulkner, who Faulkner mm -hmm. is huge in the, the reading life of Bill Clinton also. And so everything he had put in there was, was great. And all I did was a little bit of editing. So I, I don't wanna overstate my own role at, at all. No, I'm, I'm not. I'm not overstating it. And I know that um, Bill Clinton would meet Shakespeareans like my friend and colleague, Stephen Greenblatt at Harvard, and tell yes. many of these anecdotes. Yes. In, in a really engaging way. But nobody had the, the well, tape running to capture that. And well, until you did. Well, like Lincoln, he he w w is a remarkable autodidact. And I, um, I, mean, I haven't been in close touch with him for a few years, but I did, I was his speechwriter and I worked with him on his autobiography and the Bible, Bible phrases come to him. He doesn't have to look it up. They just, he, he has kind of um, imbibed the Bible and, and there's a kind of auditory learning that happened with him that I suspect happened with Lincoln too, where it's almost not even reading. He just heard enough sermons that there's something internalized that he can go to, but he is, he has a remarkable memory, just like Lincoln did. I mean, although you, you quote them, the painters who were painting Lincoln or his assistants writing in their diaries, Lincoln could just go on and on for many minutes, full memory of Shakespeare passages, which is not easy to do if you're not an actor. I can't do it. And I've been teaching these plays for 40 years. After about three lines, I lose the thread. And he would mesmerize the young men in the telegraph office where he would have to sit and wait for news from the front reciting these speeches. And, and he's not the only one in the 19th century who could do that. Obviously, he's learning these passages from anthologies that are circulating at the time to teach oratorical skills. And uh, one of the things that I loved about your book was the train arriving in, in, I think, Rochester, New York, where Frederick Douglass lived. And I, I didn't know that about Douglass. Yeah. I assume everybody lives in New York City until told otherwise. And um, so Douglas is there. Douglas is, um, and I didn't know this until recently, but Douglas is, participates in a Shakespeare group reading the part of Shylock. Douglas has a portrait of, of um, Othello and Desdemona on the wall of his study. And, and Douglas, like Lincoln, incorporates Shakespeare into his most powerful rhetoric in, in quite different ways and more, and he's more, much more willing to quote Shakespeare than Lincoln would be. But I find that, you know, I was hoping that Lincoln and Douglas would kind of meet and chat, if you mean a fictionalized version of your chapter on Rochester. Yeah, I, I wanted them to meet too, and I, I couldn't find it. I mean, they meet later and it's very moving when they do meet, I think three times, and the last one is the best, 
on the day of the second inaugural. Um, Douglas is right up front and hears this incredible speech, maybe the best speech in American history. And here's Lincoln say that American slavery was the cause of all of this. And he doesn't say Southern slavery, he says American, mm -hmm. meaning we all were implicated. And then Douglas tries to go to the White House reception and the guards won't let him in wow. because of his skin color. And somehow Lincoln, I don't want to get this wrong, but I think he saw him as he was at the door not getting in and said, oh, there's my friend Douglas. And that changed it. And Douglas came in and Lincoln said, what did you think of my speech? And Douglas said, Mr. President, that was a sacred effort. I think that's what he said, but um, they really grew to appreciate each other. In 1861, when he's coming on the train through, right, they, Douglas probably wouldn't have loved Lincoln that much because Lincoln didn't seem very abolitionist at that point, but by 1865, he had become, in my opinion, the greatest abolitionist in American history. He had ended slavery and it was ending it again and again and again, the first time with the Emancipation Proclamation, but then the 13th Amendment and um, they respected each other. And I, I'm grateful to Douglas for his words about Lincoln because Lincoln is still sort of controversial. And in, in say the 1619 project, he doesn't come off very well. And yet what he did was Titanic and in his lifetime, he was deeply appreciated by African Americans, and that lasted well into the 20th century. And I, I just want to get it right. I don't want to fall prey to political pressures from one side or the other. And what Lincoln suffered as a human sufferer, and what he did as a very canny political leader to, to crush slavery in this country was it's the reason we revere him. We, we love his words. I love his words, but he solved the biggest Rubik's Cube in American history. We, we were so supposedly all about democracy, but we had slavery. He took care of it. He ended it. And so whatever faults he had, I, I think we need to honor him. One of, one of the ways in which I, I quietly try to set up Lincoln is by writing in an earlier chapter about John Quincy Adams, uh, our sixth president, son of the second president, who I, I was always told or had read was a great abolitionist and celebrated for that. Somebody who went back into Congress after serving as president simply to fight the annexation of Texas and to fight Southern uh, slaveholders. And yet, once you see him through the prism of Shakespeare, with John Quincy Adams writing a really forgettable and embarrassing essay on Desdemona, vilifying this young woman for falling in love with and marrying a black man, you realize the limits of many abolitionists, maybe even Lincoln early on, which is, right. it's one thing to be free. You're just not free to love anybody you want. And uh, John Quincy Adams made it very clear that even the most liberal of minds drew a line at amalgamation, or we call it miscegenation. Right. So that so many of these issues that we're struggling with today uh, bedeviled uh, even the most right-minded. Yeah, that's a great point. It's troubling, and you're absolutely right. And John Quincy Adams bowed as much on the right side of history as you could be, and yet there are flaws. You're, you're absolutely right. And he never discusses miscegenation anywhere in the thousands of pages of diaries that are sitting up in storage in Massachusetts right, right. now, except with Shakespeare. That right. somehow, and, and the premise of my book is people have views they won't express. At least this book was written before this country became full Trumpist and you're hearing the expressions of things that are have never been expressed by congressional leaders in our history, or maybe not for a very long time. And Shakespeare gives them a license to say things, to reveal things about themselves for better and for worse than they otherwise would never have revealed. 
And that's fun for me because as a Shakespearean, I can pick up the scraps and kind of peer behind the curtain of the personality and identify tendencies in them that uh, sometimes, you know, terrified me and sometimes thrilled me. Well, I, I just love the tack you're on looking at our, well, you, you organize your book around transformative years but how Shakespeare's being read. And it just is, is a great through line. And in the 19th century, especially Americans were absolutely obsessed and it wasn't high culture. It was in fact, probably more low culture than, than high culture as, as you point out. And the book ends of course with Donald Trump's supporters uh, rushing the stage at the Delacorte Theater at a production of Julius Caesar, which had a Trump like Caesar who was assassinated by actors of color, and they did not like that. And none of the ironies of the production landed on that sect. But um, I think Donald Trump mentioned Romeo and Juliet once in his four years in office, and that's the closest he ever came to invoking the bar. Wow, when, when was that? I, you know, I don't know. Exactly. It wasn't in a very rich, complicated context. I don't think he was referring to the play as much as to the iconic figures of these great lovers. Yeah. I don't see him. I mean, even presidents like Truman and Eisenhower were steeped in Shakespeare, acted in Shakespeare in school productions, and were knowledgeable. And I, I personally would love to interview Barack Obama and ask him about his Shakespeare experience, um, but have never had the chance to do that. Um, Biden, I know, loves Irish poetry, Seamus Heaney and, and others, and has a literary bent, but I don't know whether Shakespeare figures at all in yeah. his imagination. Yeah. Yeah, probably not. It's hard, hard to imagine that. So should we open it up to questions and then if they go silent, go back to talking between ourselves? Yeah, Nikki is going to run the um, Q&A. So there's a, a couple in the chat, but please do raise your hand and Nikki will call on you and you can ask our authors yourself if you're not shy. I can't read the chat, it's too small, and I'd be sticking Nikki my will read them right against the screen, yeah. so I don't want to yeah. scare anyone. I'm just seeing Mary Rosenberger's on Amtrak, so that's not far from my book. I'm, I'm so happy to see that. She did that on purpose, Pat. She wanted <laughs> okay. to be on the Love train. It. Uh, yeah. Love it. We actually have a couple of um, uh, guild council and board members on the on so please do introduce yourself um, on the chat so mary is our ceo we have um i see uh, laura peterson's here she's the uh president of the foundation board um let's say peter's course, there peter peter petras who's on the uh, on the council so oh a, a very uh, Stacy Schiff, the biographer, is on. Welcome, everybody. So, um, Nikki, take, take the question. Uh, Laura, did you have your hand up? If you want to ask yours first, and then I'll go to the chat. I did. It's just sort of um, an existential question. I think Lincoln was about 56 when he was assassinated. What do you imagine his future would have been had that not occurred? Well, it's kind of like John F. Kennedy. I, I feel like it would have been harder than we imagined that he had to, he would have had to deal with immense problems relating to the reconstruction of the country. It's sort of easy to say he would have been better than Andrew Johnson. I think that's a no brainer, but would he have gotten through his second term as well as he got through his first term? It's, it's, it's hard to know. Um, being a Southerner, of kind of, uh, he, he would have been much better at, at sort of, well, Johnson is a Southerner too, but Lincoln was a more sympathetic kind of a Southerner than Johnson was. And um, he also had a lot of experience with Congress after four years of fighting the Civil War. And 
that's where most of the big issues came in, in the late 1860s. Mm -hmm. there, there were fights between Congress and the president. And I think Lincoln's savviness and his moderation and his for cap capacity for forgiveness would have helped the country a, a lot. So um, I, I don't think it would have been painless, but I think he would have gotten through to, to the end of a second term and the country would have been better, re better reconstructed than it was under Andrew Johnson and the Congress would have been happier with, with the executive. Well, thanks. This is a terrific program. I love the work that both of you guys do. I love just hearing the two of you talk about anything. Well, it's fun for us. You know, I don't know enough about Lincoln's successors the only anecdote that I know is my favorite anecdote from my book, so I'll share it. Um, on the eve of the Mexican-American War, when half the US Army was uh, down in Corpus Christi, Texas, waiting to cross the Rio Grande and uh, extend the reach of slavery, essentially, they discovered that the troops were bored and were fighting and drinking and needed to be distracted. So the officers, most of whom were West Point trained, got together and built a theater and started performing plays. And one of the first plays they put on was Othello, which is a kind of strange choice if you're dealing with the problem of the black man in slavery at, at this time. But it's also a military play and one that they could respond to as soldiers. And um, Longstreet, strapping football player, six foot one or so, was uh, initially cast to play Desdemona, and he was thought to be not physically right for the part. So they looked around and they found another officer, a second lieutenant, who was, I think, five foot five or even, you know, five foot six and about 135 pounds. And his name was Ulysses S. Grant, and he was put in a dress and asked to play Desdemona against oh. Othello. And um, apparently really rehearsed the part and got into the role. Um, but the, the actor playing uh, Othello, a man named Porter, who would die very shortly after this, uh, couldn't get up enough sentiment for playing against a cross-dressed Ulysses S. Grant. But I love the idea of a man who would later go on to lead the Union forces into victory seeing the world through the eyes of a Shakespeare heroine married to a black man. I just, I just love that. And it sticks with me. Wow. That's incredible, Jim. All right. We have a question in the chat from Tim who wants to know what is it about Lincoln and Shakespeare that makes them so relevant to us today? Ted, you want to take that one first? Well, we want literary presidents. We want presidents who are good at words. Um, speaking to the American people is important and, and finding the right words. And we want to be moved by our, our presidents. And um, a president who reads Shakespeare is thinking seriously about language. But then also, you know, you have the, the incredible understanding of the human condition in Shakespeare. You have avarice and selfishness, but also generosity and selflessness. And, and so a president who's reading a lot of Shakespeare is becoming deeper. And we want someone like that in that job, or I, I would say, I, I am still a book reader and not a TV reader, but we, we just had a kind of terrifying four years with a TV reader, TV watcher, and not a book reader in the, in the White House. And we saw some of the limitations of, of what that can bring. One of the things that uh... I included in my anthology of Shakespeare in America, and I, I like to teach, is the letter that John Adams, the second president of the United States, wrote to his son, John Quincy Adams, explaining that he was reading through all of Shakespeare's histories again and again to try to figure out what was wrong in the founding of the country that he had played such an important part of. So Shakespeare has a lot of political lessons. And one of the political lessons Shakespeare has in his histories and tragedies is he's interested in leadership and he's not interested in celebrating leadership. He's interested in putting leaders under pressure and then cranking up that pressure as much as he can until that leader breaks. 
And in play after play after play, you watch leaders crushed under the pressures of leadership. And for me, Lincoln was self-aware of what those pressures were to a remarkable degree. And that to me both shows why Lincoln is still valuable and also to me why Shakespeare is still valuable and the two in conjunction with each other teach us valuable lessons about leadership when we are starved for leadership in this country. That's beautifully put, Jim. Thanks so much. Another question in the chat. I also want to encourage everybody, if you actually want to ask your question out loud, just raise your hand. I promise I will see you. Um, from the chat, we have who else influenced Lincoln the way that Shakespeare did? Well, that's to you, Ted. I'm, I'm a monomaniac about this. Um, Burns. He loved Robert Burns. He read the sort of romantic poets of the mid 19th century, like Bryant and Whittier and Byron in, in England. But um, I think a, a very important influence was the, the Bible and specifically the King James Bible, which is almost, I mean, well, it, it is not almost, it, it is contemporary with Shakespeare, 1611. And there are, I mean, it wasn't just the life lessons offered by the Bible, but the music of that particular English edition and words reappear throughout Lincoln's speeches um, as they do from Shakespeare. And so I think he, he was an interesting young man growing up in, uh, on the frontier in Southern Indiana without very many books, but the few books he had, he really absorbed. And one was the King James Bible whether reading or hearing it spoken, and then eventually Shakespeare also. And you mentioned eloquently in your book, Pilgrim's Progress by, by yes, Bunyan. Thank you, yep. He loved that book. And for generations that rank high up in, in reading lists, so to speak. Right, that, that was reprinted a lot in early America, Pilgrim's Progress by John Bunyan, and it, in a way, I, I mean, it worked for my book about the train trip because it's an allegorical, allegorical book about a journey from a, a place of sort of humility toward this gliss, shimmering city, the celestial city, kind of like Washington DC set up on a hill with a big dome. The dome was not finished when he got there, but um, he, that, that book spoke to Americans in the, in the 19th century. Um, Peter, would you like to ask your question or would you like me to read it? <laughs> I had to find my mute button there. Um, I, uh, I, I, I wasn't quite done with one of the answers you gave two questions ago, which was you got right up to the point of leadership uh, takeaways and didn't say any of what they were. So I'm just curious whether one or two jump out for you in this. Um, I usually stop at that point. One of the things, <laughs> that, one of the things that I do to, um, to pay for summer vacation and also to expose myself to something other than millennials, which is what I do during the day at Columbia University. I. Um, I teach international executives Shakespeare, and I discuss leadership with people who are industry leaders, whether they're running the oil business in Saudi Arabia or airlines or, or the like. And I don't ever make suggestions on positive messages of leadership in Shakespeare because there are none. Shakespeare is not interested in a guide to successful leadership. He's interested in breaking leaders down, in, in showing that those who easily arrive at authority don't know how to handle it when they get there, or others who struggle to get there don't get there all the way. He, he doesn't seem particularly interested in success stories. That's not uh, his, his interest. And as a result, it's, it's not my interest. And when I look at Joe Biden, for example, um, I'm very interested in how he will deal with adversity far better than how he deals with yeah. what I hope will be more occasional successes. 
But uh, Shakespeare is only really useful uh, when he puts his character on characters under unbearable strain. And again, you know, if there's anybody who lived through unbearable strain of watching maybe 700,000 Americans die on his watch, which I suppose now Trump and Biden have also witnessed, that, that, that's an unbearable strain. But Lincoln was the first to face that. No wonder he never cracked a smile in the photos. <sighs> yeah. True. All right, next question, Tim. Would you like to read yours out loud? Or do you want me to read it? I'll, uh, I'll read it. Can you hear? Um, so maybe I'll, I'll change this for you. I'm interested in some of the fictional works that have written, uh, such as uh, Maggie O'Farrell's Hammett or um, George Saunders' uh, Lincoln and Lombardo, and what you fellows uh, think of those works if you've, if you've read them. I, I love Lincoln and the Bardo. Um, I started it and I couldn't understand it. I, I just was sweating my way through the first few pages, first few chapters. And then I finally understood what was happening and I thought it was brilliant and exhilarating. I, I mean, it's a depressing kind of topic area, but still the, the writing is so lyrical and beautiful that I absolutely loved it. And I later worried about my own book. My title was not so different, Lincoln on the Verge or Lincoln in the Bardo. And I had come up with that title before I, uh, that book came out, but um, the books are so different that I think it's okay. But I like, the idea, and I think Shakespeare would like the idea of using Lincoln as a kind of character in a quasi work of fiction. I can speak in a very limited way about um, Hamnet, which was highly recommended to me very early on by members of the Authors Guild uh, Council as a spectacular work. And um, I started it was enormously impressed with the style and verve of the writing, but stopped because I'm a nonfiction uh, person and a lot of Shakespeare biographers drift into fiction. Hamnet is a work of fiction, but the boundaries between fictionalizing Shakespeare's life and looking at the record and telling that story require for me a firewall, simply because it's very dangerous making things up because that road has led to people speculating that somebody other than Shakespeare has written those works. That's not what Hamnet is about, but Hamnet fictionalizes Shakespeare's relationship with his son, with plague that struck England in the 1590s. My Shakespeare was a man who left Stratford for London in the late 1580s, who reportedly went back once a year to his family. So by the time his son Hamnet had died, Shakespeare, since Hamnet was a toddler, perhaps had seen him a half dozen times, no more. So I'm not interested in romantic portraits of Shakespeare sentimentalizing him in a way that we all find very moving. Um, that's just not my Shakespeare, and I can't keep reading accounts of it for that reason. And uh, again, it's, it's my own hobby horse. I'll give another anecdote about the dangers of conspiracy thinking about Shakespeare or the dangers of deciding how you want to tell his life story. Um, I wrote a book a number of years ago, back in, I think, 2010, called Contested Will, about people who romanticized Shakespeare's life and began to believe somebody else wrote the plays. And shortly after the book came out, I got a, a letter from Washington, D.C. Uh, that said Supreme Court on it. And I thought, they don't have jury duty on the Supreme Court. They can't be asking me to come down there and serve. And I opened it up, ripped it open, which I should not have done. I should have carefully saved the envelope. And it was a letter from Justice Stevens, who is a jurist I deeply admire. And he wrote to me that um, 
Shakespeare's signature only exists in six scribbled forms. Uh, he clearly was illiterate and could not have been the author of his plays. And I was just staggered because he was one of the most brilliant men, uh, I thought, and still do in the country, peddling conspiracy theory. And I wrote back saying, Dear Justice Stevens, I noticed that your secretary both typed your letter and signed it for you. It's extraordinary that you, like Shakespeare, are functionally illiterate and have done so much in your career. And I thought my um, impertinent response would be the end. But a letter came back about a week later, and he persisted in insisting on his conspiracy theory. And I finally said, look, the particular conspiracy theory you believe in is traced back to a man who invented it in opposition to democracy. You, you cannot believe in that and believe in democracy. You, you just can't. Those are two things that can't be reconciled. And he wrote back basically saying, I can and I do. And I said, well, that's the end of our, our conversation. As much respect as I have for you, um, I can't accept that. So that's the long and short answer to why I haven't finished Maggie O'Farrell's wonderful novel, Hamnet. Mm. <laughs> well, that is a pretty good uh, last question I would Day, unless anybody has one more, we just have two minutes left. So if somebody wants to take um, the last question out, we please raise your hand. I think Mary would like to ask the final question. Go okay. for it, Mary. Hi. Hi, thank you guys so much for joining us tonight. This has been really, really interesting. Um, I, you know, when Jim, you were talking about how Lincoln um, could recite Shakespeare, um, by memory and, you know, in a way that you couldn't today and most of us couldn't today. And I just, I had uh, to went to, through the French school system on Saturday night and they, um, they had to memorize a lot of poetry um, for, I guess, the Bach. Yeah, I, I just wonder what you think of, you know, are our brains too full these days with other things to, memorize and what is the importance for leadership and for persuasion in in learning to memorize which we don't anymore I, i'm going to i'm going to go off on a rant so i'll keep it very short and say i was forced to memorize poetry as a young child in school and uh, in hebrew school as well in hebrew and i know that when i am senile the last thing I'll be able to recall is not what I had for breakfast that day, but long stretches of poetry. And I think much is lost when we don't have a shared body of poetry. I, I can't tell you how many women of a certain age, 80s and 90s, come up to me and recite Portia's speech on the quality of mercy. And uh, I've heard Ruth Bader Ginsburg recite that powerfully. And I think something is lost when we lose cultural glue in this country. I'm not telling anyone here anything you don't know, but the less commonality we have, the greater the chasm is that stands between us and uh, those who don't share our political perspectives. So for that reason alone, Shakespeare, a little island of sanity and common ground that's fast eroding has to be preserved. Thank you for that. And then quick last question. How much do we actually know factually about Shakespeare? And how much do we factually know about Lincoln? So now you once told me there are a lot of books written about Shakespeare. We don't really know that much about his well, life. Well, I wrote a review in yesterday's New York Times book review uh, from, for those listening at a future right, point, yeah. this will be the, 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 the 5th of uh, December, uh, 2021. Mm -hmm talking about really how little we know and how much of that is inflected by those who discovered it. And I guess my last question for Ted is, how much of the Lincoln we have is uh, a product of the hagiography of 1865 and how much of it is level-headed, clear, fair scholarship? It's still moving around. Uh, the, a, a new edition of 
Herndon's researches, which you, you know well, um, Lincoln's law partner, William Herndon, after he died, did this incredible oral history of Abraham Lincoln. He wrote to everyone he knew who might have known Lincoln and got their testimony about this unusual person. And a lot of that only was published about 10 years ago. So it, it is still moving around. There, is, there are certain things like we used to think a legend, the story of Ann Rutledge, the woman he was in love with who died when he was a young man. We thought that was a legend. Now we really think it happened. So it's it's shifting in the world of Lincoln studies. And I think that's exciting. We know most of it, of course, but there are little pockets that come up for, into, into the public's view and that, that makes history exciting. I'm Ted. gonna give Ted the last word. Yeah, Ted, thank you so much, Jim, thank you. It was a really great night and uh, we truly appreciate your time. And um, next week at 5 p.m., for those of you who come every week, and some of you do, um, Jay McInerney is going to be talking with Andre Houston Mack um, about wine, wine writing, selecting, serving. Andre is the first African-American sommelier. He worked for Per Se and the French Laundry. He started his own wine label and Jay McInerney, the novelist turned wine writer. And uh, so they're gonna have a uh, recommendation for us at 5 p.m., which he, which Jay calls the aperitif hour. Um, so we'll, that will be um, the last of this calendar year and then we'll start up again in January. So thanks everybody.